Thank you very much for being here as I begin to prepare to defend my thesis. I have a lot to go over, so I'm just going to go ahead and get right into it. I'd like to introduce my topic comparing long and short duration submaximal isometric contractions to traditional plyometrics as performance potentiators for sprinting. I'd like to begin by providing a brief overview of what I'll be discussing today. I'm going to start by talking about the background of potentiation, then addressing the purposes and hypotheses in this study, the methods to test the hypotheses, the results of those tests, and finally, the implications of the findings. Beginning with the background on potentiation, I want you to look at this right, uh, the image on the right. When we use a conditioning contraction, we increase the potentiation within the muscle, but we also induce fatigue. And potentiation ultimately is using this conditioning contraction to enhance subsequent muscle performance. So as fatigue decreases, the potentiation response also decreases, but we see this increase in performance right here. This is traditionally done by using a high force muscle contraction or with heavy resistance or by using high velocity contractions of the way of plyometrics. The issue is that those approaches can be impractical in some settings with the high force contractions. You can't put a squat rack next to a basketball court. That just doesn't make sense. And some athletes don't have the prerequisite skills to perform plyometric exercises effectively enough to actually initiate a potentiated response. Therefore, the purpose of this study is to determine the best way to acutely enhance 20 meter sprinting performance by testing the efficacy of using a submaximal isometric protocol in comparison to a traditional plyometric protocol. The hypotheses established in the study first were to determine that the submaximal protocols were equivalent to the plyometric protocols. Second, that our long duration isometric protocol would be superior to the short duration and that all experimental protocols would be superior to our control protocol. The methodologies, I'm gonna go over a brief little overview of this section. I'm gonna start by talking about the study design, then introducing the participants and the protocols used in the study. And then finally, the measurement devices to collect the sprint times and the statistical analyses used to test the hypotheses. The study design, we started, this was a randomized crossover design. And this had four sessions over a four week period or one session per week. And all of these sessions were built into the athletes off season training schedule. We didn't wanna to ask too much of them. They're already as busy as can be, but all of them were in their off season phase of their training schedule. So not readily competing in their sport. All of the sessions were about 30 minutes. The first session was a bit longer, about 45, because we had to fill out the informed consent, go over further explanations of the protocols of the study and fill out the health questionnaire. Now for the participants, we had eight female division one athletes that participated in either basketball, soccer, or volleyball. The inclusion criteria for the study was that they had to have a minimum of one year training experience in a collegiate sports setting. And second, they had to be cleared for physical activity. And what this is, this is a term used by our sports medicine staff, which essentially means that they are fully able to participate in their sport and training, and they're not at risk of injury or re-injury. These athletes went through the protocols in a randomized order, which I'm gonna actually address on this side of the slide. Our baseline, we used a control warmup to serve as a non-dynamic or a non-potentiating warmup to warm the athlete up as little as possible, but not risk injury. All of the participants performed this protocol on their very first session. The randomization came with our experimental protocol sessions two through four. And we had a plyometric, a short duration and a long duration isometric contraction, the long being 30, the short being 10 seconds aside. It's important to note that the control, the non dynamic warm up, though everybody did perform it on the very first session, this served as the base for all of the experimental protocols, meaning if they're going to do the short duration protocol, they began with the same non dynamic warm up that they did for session one and added on the isometric protocol. They performed three sprints at each of these protocols at one, five, and 10 minutes post potentiation or post protocol. In total, they performed 12 sprints for the entire study. Now, to provide some examples of these uh, exercises performed in each protocol, I'm actually in some of these images to prove that I am a real person, not just a head on a screen. So what we can see here is our bent knee hamstring exercise, actively holding the leg in place, extending the foot up to the ceiling, curling leg back down and extending back up, performing 10 repetitions on this side, finding length in the hamstring while keeping the lower back fixed to the ground. We see our leg lower exercise, athlete actively lowering the leg, lightly tapping the heel on the ground, finding now length in the hamstring or in the hip flexor, as well as the hamstring, 
bring the leg back up and back down 10 times on each side, lower back crush into the ground. Now, an example of a standing movement prep, we see a body weight good morning or a hinge exercise. The athlete starts up tall, drives the hip back, just trying to find space again in the posterior chain, keeping the back nice and flat. And we see here standing knee pull exercise, actively triple extending through the support leg, pulling the knee up high to the chest, trying not to fall backwards again, keeping everything in line. For our plyometric protocols, we had two different versions of these exercises. We had two stationary and two bounding exercises. The first of our stationary exercises, we see a squat jump right here. The athlete would squat down, jump up as high as they can. As soon as they touch the ground, they're trying to react, get back up as high as they can. Again, performing 10 of these movements with hands on hips. Now for a bounding example, what we see here, the athlete's driving their foot into the ground. They're, comp they're completing this over the 20 meter course, starting at zero and taking as many jumps as it takes to complete the course. They're gonna project themselves up as high as they can. As soon as they land on that same side, they're gonna switch, drive off the opposite leg all the way through the end. Our second example of a stationary exercise, these are our pogo hops. The athlete will land with soft knees, but we're not trying to squat down. As soon as they touch the ground with flat feet, they're just bouncing off the ground, trying to be as quick as they can, doing 10 of these jumps. And our second bounding exercise, skip for distance. The athlete's driving their foot into the ground, projecting out forward as far as they can, trying to complete the course in as few jumps as possible. And now for our isometric protocol, this is our starting position. We're starting in a half kneeling position, back knee is on the ground. The athlete will drive this front foot in. When they're ready, I will count down three, two, one. They press in, they elevate that back knee off the ground. They're gonna maintain this position for either 10 or 30 seconds, depending if it's short or the long duration. After they've completed the first side, they're gonna step up on the back leg, stand up nice and tall. They'll then step back down on the opposite leg and we'll repeat the process. I'll count down three, two, one. When they're ready, they'll drive up off that back knee. We'll complete both sides. And as an example for our starting position for our sprints, what we can see here is a two point staggered start. This is our zero meter line or our start line where we see the tape marked. The athlete would be one shoe length behind that to, in, to account for their body lean. We didn't want this to turn into a 19 and a half meter sprint. So they would start this position choosing whichever foot they preferred to have forward. They would be motionless and on their movement, whenever I said that they were in a good position, they would start the sprint and I would manually start the remote. They'd sprint down through the 20 meter mark where we had our photo gates facing each other. When they broke through the light beam, the timer would stop. And I'm actually gonna explain the measurement device a little bit more here. We used the Brower TC timing system. This has a noted accuracy to one one thousandth of, of a second and a tested measurement error between 0.9 and 2.9%. Right here, we can see our photo gates. They would sit on top of these tripods and they would be facing each other at the 20 meter mark Again, when the athlete broke through and broke the light beam, it would stop the remote right here that I would be holding that I manually started. Once I had collected all the data, we had no missing data. All athletes completed all sessions. We got to start our statistical analysis. We started with a normality test. We used the KS test and QQ plots to determine normality. We then used a Pearson's correlation, the findings of which actually dictated the need to run a multiple regression to um, to assess the need to use covariates in our ANOVA analysis. Now, to the results. Starting with our normality testing, I'll explain the results from that, our correlation and our regression. And finally, our ANOVA broken up into two. We look at, we're gonna look at our main effects first. Second, our pairwise comparisons, which actually serve to test the hypotheses of this study. Within our results, starting with the normality, only the short duration isometric protocol, the average times of all three, came back as not normally distributed. All of the variables were normally distributed. Running our Pearson's R correlation, we tested height against the average times of the control, the plyometric, short and long duration across all three rest protocols. And we did the same thing with weight. In the findings, height and weight with that short duration average came back as significantly correlated and it's with a strong positive correlation at that. The findings of which determine the need to run a multiple regression to determine if we needed to use height or weight as a covariate within our uh, ANOVA analysis. Our predictors being height and weight. Our outcome, we just generated one average sprint time across all of the protocols, across all the rest times to use as the outcome variable. When assessing, we see an insignificant p-value 
and an adjusted R square of 0.26 or 26% of the overall variance within this sample being predicated by the height and weight. Due to this insignificant relationship, we determined that no covariates were needed due to these weak associations. Now, for the results of the four by three repeated measures ANOVA, the within subjects effects. First, looking at the rest times, we see an insignificant p-value. However, we see a large effect size for the partial A to square. And what this says is that 30% of the overall sprint performance in this study was dictated by the rest time performed by the athlete. Second, when we look at the protocols, we see a significant effect from the protocols in this study and their effects on sprinting performance within the sample, and an even larger effect size demonstrating 36% of the overall variance in this um, of the sample being dictated by the protocol run by the athlete. Finally, looking at the rest time with the protocol to determine an interaction effect, we see an insignificant p-value determining that there was not an interaction and a smaller effect size, though still moderate, but no interaction was determined between the rest times and the protocol of this study on the sample. Now, looking at hypothesis one, determining how the plyometric compared to the isometric protocols. What we can see here with these overlapping error bars is that there were not significant differences between the groups. And that's where we can look at these pairwise comparisons. When we're looking at plyo against the short duration protocol, the plyometric group was about five hundredths of a second faster, but though insignificantly different. And the long duration was about three hundredths of a second faster and insignificantly different. Therefore, based on the lack of difference between these groups, we can determine, we can accept this first hypothesis that our isometric protocols performed as well as the plyometric protocols in this study. Second, looking at the long duration, outperforming the short duration, again, using a similar graph, we see with these almost identical error bars that they were not significantly different. And this is reinforced with our mean differences when we're looking at the plyometric versus the short duration the short duration being about two hundredths of a second slower, though statistically insignificant. Therefore, we must reject the second hypothesis that the long duration protocol did not outperform the short duration. And third, our experimental versus our control. What we can see here through this estimated means table, again, with these overlapping error bars, we could assume that all of the protocols were not significantly different. And this is reinforced here. Comparing our control to our plyo, it was about a tenth of a second slower but insignificantly different. We can see here versus the short, 400ths of a second, and the long, 500ths of a second slower, though statistically insignificant. Therefore, we must reject the third hypothesis that the experimental protocols did not outperform the control. Now, for the implications of these findings, I wanna show you this picture right here. This is a finish of the men's 100 meter final at the Barcelona Olympics. And it's a very famous photo just because of how close all of these runners were into this final. Now, this table represents the times of that race. I want you to look at second place, 10.02, and sixth place, 10.12. That is a tenth of a second. That is about the same difference between our control protocol and our plyometric. Now, oh, let me go back. And right here, third to fourth, we see five hundredths of a second difference. That's the same difference between our, apply, our control and our long duration protocol. I bring this up because a tenth of a second separating these five places right here made a big difference in these men's lives. This is man gets to leave as a silver medalist, while this one, not even a podium finisher. The same thing here, bronze medalist, not a podium finisher, just separated by hundreds of a second. The reason I bring this up is it can't be lost on us that hundreds of a second matter. In sprinting, this race was conducted over 100 meters where we could assume larger differences between the top runners. Our study had 20 meters of distance we, where we could assume that the differences might be a little bit shorter. We have to remember those large effect sizes that we noted and a significant difference at that with the protocols within this small sample of only eight. 36% of the overall variance was dictated from the protocols in this study. Something was here. What we need to do for future research is replicate this design and grow this sample to see if we can get more people in this study, do those significant values push past that 0.05 barrier. From there, if we can determine significant findings, we modify. And what that looks like is, do we actually look at anthropometric variances as they relate to this study to see do longer limbed athletes do better with the plyometric? 
do shorter um, shorter limbed athletes do better with the longer duration isometric, whatever it may be. And finally, we just need to continue to test this. We need to see where are the advantages with these protocols and what kind of efficacy actually is there using a submaximal protocol compared to the tra traditional literature. Sports performance is a constantly moving field. And if there's any sort of advantage we can determine from this sample, we need to continue to press forward and move on to see what we can find. And finally, I'll leave you with my references. Thank you very much for your time.